knowledge and professional development. But we do recognize that this is this is a unique community because of the keen interest in the topic of AI that spans a wide variety of stakeholders on campus, across disciplines, programs, job class, job functional roles. So it's a unique challenge for our planning group to design a space and structure for the community that truly supports and enriches all of you. So to that end, our planning group is working to design a format that can best meet all of your needs while recognizing that that it's important to stay flexible and be open to input from you. We will look to you as co-creators of this community. So um, make sure to join the community Google group. We'll put that link in the chat if you are a UC Berkeley staff member um, to keep in, up to date on our next offerings, to give us input, to stay involved. And um, we're thrilled to, um, to have you here today and to begin on this journey together. Great, thank you, Kara. And I'm just looking to see if Brandy's here. Yes, she is. So let me just uh, do some introductions, and then we'll um, we'll let's uh, Kara, if you can pin Brandy up here as well. Uh, I will just do a really quick introduction for those of you who don't know Dr. Nanaki. Uh, Brandy is the founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab at the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interests of Society in the Banatow Institute, or Citrus. Um, she's at UC Berkeley here as an associate research professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy. She directs the Tech Policy Initiative, which is focused on strengthening tech policy education research and its impact on society. She's the director of Our Better Web, a program that supports empirical research policy analysis, training and engagement to address the sharp rise of online harms. She's the co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology at Berkeley Law, where she leads the project on artificial intelligence platforms and society. Brandy also co-directs the Berkeley AI Policy Hub, uh, which is an interdisciplinary initiative training researchers to develop effective AI governance and policy frameworks. She's just launched a new uh, groundbreaking video and audio series called Tech Hype, which we will put in the links for you. Um, that debunks misunderstandings around emerging technologies and explores effective technical and policy strategies. Um, she served as the Technology and Human Rights Fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard. She's been part of Schmidt Futures International Strategy Forum, the Aspen Institute, the World Economic Forum, uh, where she was instrumental in helping produce their AI procurement <laughs> in a box toolkit, which I actually learned about from her when she advised me on the Berkeley Connected Campus program that we started a couple years ago, which was for smart campus applications. Uh, Brandy's research has been published in Science, Wired, Telecommunications Policy, the Journal, Journal of Information Technology and Politics, and her work's been cited by the SFTC, the uh, NIST, and the White House. And, you know, frankly, when we were organizing uh, the recent Notre Dame uh, AI forum, uh, Brandy was advising the White House, the Senate and Congress on AI and flew in um, and, and presented there where she kicked off uh, the whole conference with her keynote and it was so well received. The main comments that I, I got from institutions all over the United States was, wow, we need to take what we learned from that and figure out how to apply that back at our own institutions. So um, that was part of the impetus is let's do that here and, and see what we can learn from Brandy. And so Brandy, I'm so thrilled that you're kicking off the entire AI community of practice and helping us think about all of this. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bill. It's really my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I threw into the chat a link to our Tech Hype show where we debunk misunderstandings around emerging technologies, debate the real benefits and risks, and explore technical and policy interventions. I also included a link to our Citrus Policy Lab where we lead a lot of our research. Our mission really is to support evidence-based policymaking, not only in the public sector for government, but also within the private sector, especially given um, the United States tendency to allow these emerging technology companies to self-regulate. So at least uh, when I look back at history, I will have said, you know, provided I did try to provide some guidance to these companies to do harm, no, not to do harm and to you know be better for society. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, can somebody give me screen share? Okay. All right. The worst thing about doing screen share is I can no longer see all of you. I can only see maybe three or four of you. Um, so 
if you raise your hand, I also don't see the chat. Let me just open up the chat here just in case somebody has a question. Okay, now I do see the chat. All right, so my presentation today is really drawing upon work that we've been doing at the University of California for a number of years now, starting back in 2019. Um, and at that time, there had been a lot of talk about regulating artificial intelligence, especially given its risk for perpetuating biases, um, you know, creating inefficiencies in systems, the environmental effects, climate effects. And you know, it wasn't lost on me that government was often looking at regulating this technology, but the public sector wasn't actually looking at how they themselves should govern the technology, whether they're designing and deploying them uh, themselves or, yeah, so the techhype.org, it should reroute, um, maybe copy and paste it in, this will work. And it's only one, it's only one H. So I think you could try that. Okay, so the work that we're doing, um, you have my affiliation, there's the, the tech hype. Um, so hopefully y'all can check it out. The work that we're leading at the University of California has been trans transformational. We were the first university to establish responsible AI principles and guidance on appropriate practices to operationalize those principles. <laughs> It's one thing to create responsible AI principles, of course, of supporting transparency, accountability, fairness, non-discrimination, but how you actually implement that in practice when you're designing or procuring an AI-enabled tool is incredibly difficult, which we have come to find out. So before we dive into the strategy that we've been you know, pursuing within the University of California, I wanna talk about definitions because oftentimes when we are talking about artificial intelligence to each other, we're talking past each other. The way I might be thinking about artificial intelligence may be different from you. Um, given that, uh, it's, I think somebody has their mic on. It sounds like we're we're all muted now. Um, okay, so it's a, it's paramount that when we're talking, we get on the same page of definitions. So we can think about defining AI from essentially two framings. One, AI as has been do, defined by laws and institutions, and then how AI is actually defined by the discipline by computer science. So let's look first at uh, the National AI Initiative Act of 2020, which is right now our only law on the books. Um, there are over 200 pieces of legislation proposed at the federal level to regulate AI systems. Not many of them have moved forward. Um, so the National AI Initiative Act uh, turned, became law in 2020, and it set up the National AI Initiative Office and essentially a governance mechanism within the federal government of overseeing AI, especially as it's used in the federal government. So they defined AI as a machine-based system that can, for a given set of, and it's important to see this, human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. Okay, so now let's look at another definition at the federal level, the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. Now this is a voluntary framework, I'll talk more about it later, uh, initiated by NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, our standard setting body, which I'm sure most of you are very, very well aware of. And this air risk management framework was released earlier this year, and it provides guidance on how do you identify and mitigate risks in machine learning AI systems. So they define an AI system uh, as an engineered or machine-based system that can, for a given set of objectives, generate outputs such as predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. Okay, so the, the definition there is pretty similar, right? Um, but let's look at the EU AI Act. Now the EU is poised to pass the most comprehensive AI related legislation in the world. The European Union, because of its large market power, is able to you know, essentially pass this law where it would say any party that's going to deploy, any entity deploy an AI system within the European market in order for them to enter the market, they must be compliant with the EU AI Act. The EU AI Act is a risk-based approach, so it looks at the likelihood that there would be risk, especially to individuals' rights, um, and to put in place risk assessments and risk mitigation strategies and demonstrate that through transparency reports to the EU. Now, they define AI as an AI system that is designed to operate with elements of autonomy, and that based on, now remember when I said 
pay attention to this human data and inputs? Um, well, it's machine and or human provided data and inputs and first how to achieve a given set of objectives using machine learning and or logic and knowledge based approaches and produces system generated outputs. Um, especially because the legislation is being debated right now. There's actually a very heated debate happening right now where Germany, Italy, and France are pushing back against the European Union, specifically calling out generative AI systems and foundation models as high risk. The Those three countries believe that AI shouldn't be regulated on the basis of technical the, the technical features, but on the risk of the applications. Uh, this actually has the potential to completely stop the AI Act from moving forward if they cannot get to a consensus. But okay, so these systems say do predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing the environments within which the AI system interacts. But it's really important to think about how is AI actually defined by the field of computer science? And so machine learning is a subcomponent of artificial intelligence, which is a sub area within computer science. But even within machine learning, there are so many. You have supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning, generative AI, foundation models, general purpose AI, Ugh, right? Overwhelming. There are so many different types of AI and how we define each of these. We can see right now in the legislation um, there is not a consensus on the how do we define general purpose AI versus foundation models? Uh, how is generative AI defined? But let's go in and look at some of these, these models uh, and what they're actually doing. So while currently everybody is very excited and talking about generative AI systems, the most common form of AI that you experience every day, whether it's you turning on Netflix to find you know, the best comedy movie to relax to at night, or if it's you know, trying to find the best hotel and travel plan for your upcoming holiday season, you're engaging with an algorithm, you're engaging with recommender systems. So machine learning, it's statistical pattern recognition or correlations in data. And I think that that phrase is so important to repeat, repeat, repeat. There is such hype around artificial intelligence that it's some... Um, Oracle, that it is so incredibly intelligent and smart, but really even chat GPT, it's not smart. All it's doing is based off of all of the data, the text data that it looked at. It's going to just predict the next word in the sentence based off of the placement of words that commonly appeared in all of the data that they had been fed. It's not like it's actually writing poetry. It's just predicting the likely next word. Uh, I want to dig into the different types of machine learning. There's supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, and reinforcement learning. Now, in supervised machine learning, you have your labeled data set. So it actually has a human labeling the data. And then you train your algorithm to analyze and cluster that data or predict outcomes based off of what you told it. So there, as the researcher, the programmer, the developer, you're coming with an assumption that the data needs to be labeled in a certain way. Well, we all know about human assumptions, right? We have these implicit biases. So one of the problems with supervised machine learning is that you can actually train your model to perpetuate possibly an implicit bias you didn't even know you had. Now, the second, unsupervised machine learning. This is another level of advancement in machine learning where you use algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets. So the model doesn't know anything about the data. It actually identifies patterns and connections and then it starts to cluster those groups. Now you could do unsupervised machine learning as a first step and then go in and look and, and fix and correct. Uh, this can also be called reinforcement learning via human feedback. So let's get to reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning are algorithms that learn through trial and error using feedback from its actions. So this would be ChatGPT, right? Where you have, you built your model and we have, teams flagging content that is maybe a, a quote hallucination of what they're saying, if any of you have heard this phrase, or if it is producing harmful content, you have individuals actually flagging that content and saying, oh no, that's not what I actually intended. If any of you play with chat GPT and you see your output and you can, you know, like regenerate another response, it asks you a thumbs up or thumbs down. I hope all of you have seen that. If you give it a thumbs up, you're reinforcing it that yes, that's what I want. I want more of that. 
and then down. So you are also training the model. Let's talk about some of the challenges. So within supervised machine learning, I already talked about it, it takes this expertise, it's time intensive. You have humans doing it, humans are, are fallible. You, know, you have those issues. Now, unsupervised machine learning, you can have high computational comp complexity because of the high volume of data. There can be a lack of transparency when you actually don't know what latent features the model had identified. So like, what were the characteristics of when this machine learning model classified a red round fruit as either an apple or a tomato? Maybe it was the texture. Maybe it was because the apple has some spotting, little spots on it, and the tomato is very shiny. You know, we don't know. We can assume. Or it might be just something we would never think of. And then reinforcement learning has all of the above, um, those concerns, and then this idea of faulty reward functions. Uh, if you are actually optimizing your model for certain outcomes, you could inadvertently create some unintended behaviors. All right, let's talk about deep learning. So deep learning is essentially what we, we're at right now. We're at the vanguard of this. This is one of the biggest um, things that has caused uh, generative AI systems to be what they are today and to look incredibly intelligent and engaging. But it's not new. The concept has actually been around since the 1950s. So while everybody now is just becoming wise to this idea of deep learning and generative AI systems, um, it, it isn't new. It, the way it works, it mimics the human brain. That's why it's called deep learning. And I can't remember if I, I don't know if I did put a picture in. I did not. Um, so within deep learning, there's various layers uh, where they're looking at your input data and then the output, and you can make these layers very, very, very complex. Um, and it's pretty hard for us to understand what's happening at each of those layers of how data is moving through and where those connections are being found. But essentially, it automates that feature extraction that I talked about earlier between a tomato and an apple and what features of it actually did the model see and say, oh, that's definitely an apple. That's definitely a tomato. Um, one common example is when they did um, image processing and I, you know, of uh, image classification essentially for dogs versus cats. And you find out, well, cats often have pointy ears. Dogs tend to have floppy ears. And that was one thing. Now, of course, there's going to be false positives and false negatives. Like a little chihuahua, let's say, has pretty pointy ears and is small and might actually look like a cat. Uh, but yes, it's one of those processes. Okay, so what are the challenges of deep learning? Well, you have large amounts of data, very large amounts of data, very powerful computing. There's a lack of transparency because of all of those layers of data processing. And this idea of faulty reward functions, it could create unintended behaviors. If anybody's interested more in that, because I want to get to more of our other stuff at the end, I would love to give you some examples of where these faulty reward functions have created sometimes pretty funny unintended behaviors in these models. Um, okay, actually, one thing I want to get at really quickly um, before we move on. Deep learning right now, as I mentioned, this is really at the vanguard of of AI development. Now, many of you probably know that the White House issued its executive order on AI on October 30th. In that executive order, it calls for a pilot of the National AI Research Resource, which is very important for all of you because this would be essentially clusters of compute power, data, and models that academic institutions would be able to gain access to. Now, the biggest issue with that is the executive order doesn't have a lot of authority. It can only launch this pilot. In that pilot, I think it's maybe around like $23 million. You can't compete with open AI that's getting billions of dollars to develop its model. So the federal government knows this. The federal government wants to pass legislation that would allow it to spend billions of dollars, but they need congressional authority. They have to pass a law to do that. That law, that bill, is actually called the Create AI Act. Uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., I asked um, the leadership in the White House, how likely do you think it is that the Create AI Act will actually pass into law? And I'm sure all of you can tell. I mean, the looks on their faces, they're not too confident. So 
while it would be great for academic institutions to be able to have access to these big compute power facilities uh, on their own, uh, it seems unlikely that, that it will move forward. And of course, we know the generative AI space, chat GPT, all of you are dealing with this right now because everybody's excited about finding out ways that we can harness generative AI to make the university more efficient and effective, but then also mitigating those risks. Now, foundation models are um, essentially, up until this point, when we developed machine learning models, they were develop developed for a very specific, one specific task. Now, foundation models are developed with these very large amounts of data, and they can actually be applied across a variety of areas. So if you think about ChatGPT, you can use it as a chatbot at a hotel. You could use it as a chatbot in a hospital. You could use it to develop code, right? There are multiple applications. That's why they're called foundation models. It's a foundation upon which many different types of applications can be developed. Um, so in the EU AI Act, they talk about the general purpose AI, um, and that would be an AI system essentially uh, that is intended to be applied in a variety of areas, such as image and speech recognition, audio and video generation, pattern detection, very large. Now, as I mentioned before, the NIST issued the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. Uh, we partnered, uh, Citrus Policy Lab partnered with the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity at UC Berkeley to develop a profile on generative AI and general purpose AI systems for the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. That profile demonstrates in about 150 pages what it looks like to actually implement the NIST AI Risk Management Framework when you are evaluating general purpose AI, generative AI systems. Um, I will also, when we get to the Q&A portion, I will put that in the chat in case you're all interested. So um, I can't see all of you, but let's just say, you know, you can maybe raise your hand internally or whatever, but how many of you do you know that your institution is using AI? Like, and maybe I can see some nods. Yes, good, Bill says yes. Good, we have some hands raised. Okay, so if your institution is using AI, I'm seeing lots of hands coming in. Okay, now how many of you who, let's just take the people who raised their hands where you're saying uh, we're using AI, do you have a responsible AI strategy? Yeah, you do, because Berkeley, we do. We do have a responsible AI strategy that was developed by the UC Presidential Working Group on AI and is now being pushed forward by the UC AI Council. So yes, indeed, you have a responsible AI strategy. And when we're thinking about the responsible AI strategy and implementation, we have to think about, well, how do we translate that into the components of responsible innovation? How do we actually take the guiding framework of our strategy and actually implement it? And it's, you know, we thought a lot about this within our working group. How do we, you know, codify the values of our institution into our behaviors of whether we're developing or, um, like developing or procuring an AI-enabled technology and then implementation of that into services. One thing that's been really bothering me is that when generative AI came onto the stage, you can see right away, everybody was just flocking to it of how do we harness this amazing technology to provide chatbots for our students to you know, help automate filing procurement claims. So everybody was because the technology was so hyped and in everybody's mind, they were moving right to how do we apply this in the services without thinking whether or not it aligned with their values. And if they had in place the appropriate behaviors, if they had in place a robust AI governance strategy that would allow them to actually harness that technology in a service. So I encourage all of you when you're thinking about this and you're thinking about using AI all the way from, you know, just weak AI, like linear logistical regression, to stronger forms like generative AI, that you're not first jumping to services, but you're thinking about what are the values of our institution and how are we actually evaluating this? And do, first, do we even need it? That's actually one of the principles for, for the University of California. Number one is appropriateness. Whether or not you really need to use AI or are you hopping on that hype cycle for fear of missing out? Um, okay, so the I talked about that prioritization. You got to prioritize your values. Your values inform the behaviors, and then the behaviors allow for the services. 
Now, what are some common responsible AI values? Over the past 10 years, the AI governance space has tended to reach a pretty good consensus on what are the responsible AI values. It should be ethical. There's a, a need for social responsibility. A big issue is inclusivity and diversity. And this is primarily because machine learning systems because they're learning from data and then scaling what they have learned, it has a very high likelihood of scaling biases that it learned in that data. And that can be extremely problematic if you're now scaling this tool to across the, the university system. And now uh, the next is transparency and accountability. In order for us to understand what's actually going on with these systems, first we should know they're being used. There should be transparency in that what type of AI they're using, uh, some transparency reporting on how well the models perform. Now, you can see that concept being sort of um, embedded into our federal initiatives and in the state of California, the White House Executive Order on AI calls for transparency reports. Earlier this year, we have the White House Voluntary AI Commitments where the large companies agreed that they would issue these reports um, discussing what are the potential risks of their system, where should they or should they not be used, uh, what are some of their weaknesses, and actually publishing that. And by doing so, that leads to accountability, right? Because we're going to actually be able to see what they're doing, and we would be able to push back. Um, and then the last one, these significantly advanced models that require large amounts of data and large amounts of compute power are putting a strain on um, the environment, right? There are climate change issues here, especially around water use and energy use. You need significant amounts of water to keep the computers cool when they're processing. And that's often something left out. So when we think about our values, you can think of, and this is better when we're in a room, but actually you could put it in the chat if you want to. What are some of the core values of your institution? So I'll just wait here for a second and let's see. What's a core value of your institution? Respectful engagement, innovation, integrity. These are good. Any more coming in? Access to knowledge, inclusivity, love it. Integrity public service equity. Yes, love love this. So let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll talk about how can you implement these uh, values. So let's look at responsible AI behaviors. <clears throat> if some, actually here, somebody said, let's see, respectful engagement. That would be, I think, ethical integrity. It could be, or social responsibility. And you could say, okay, for ethical integrity, let's add our university established a sort of ethical review board that's going to think about whether or not we should actually be deploying or developing or procuring this AI-enabled technology. For social responsibility at your institution, you might want to draw upon the NIST AI risk management framework and implement these risk impact assessment strategies. Uh, for inclusivity and diversity, Perhaps at the institution, you should, uh, you know, really push for a diverse workforce who is reviewing and developing these tools and consultation with those individuals who will be affected by the implementation. For transparency and accountability, you could have public reporting and audits so people actually know that the AI is uh, being used and then call also for third party audits to get to accountability, right? So maybe you as a developer or a vendor, you want to report these are the potential risks of our system, and these are the risk mitigation strategies we have implemented, and allow third parties to audit your system to ensure that you have actually done robust enough job mitigating the risks that you said you did. And then for sustainability, of course, assessing the environmental effects. Okay, uh, thinking about how does your institution's behavior align with its values? As I said before, the values are the foundation. Your behavior has to be built upon your values. So if you are prioritizing equity and inclusivity, okay, let's take inclusivity. Uh, and then you go through a procurement phase or a development phase where you're not actually engaging with those who will be affected by that technology. Well, your behavior is not aligned with your values. 
right? Because you weren't inclusive. How does your institution align its values and behaviors to its services? Well, let's talk about one way that we tried to do that within the University of California. We developed the AI strategy. We had three strategic goals when we developed that strategy. The first, we wanted to develop our UC responsible AI principles, drawing upon the significant work that has been done in this space in both the public and private sector. And taking from that, we went through many, many, many hours of debating what the UC responsible AI principles should be. Uh, we were able to achieve consensus on those. I believe the next slide will show you what they are. Now, the second was not only to create those principles, but to provide guidance on what are the strategies to operationalize those principles in practice. <clears throat> now, the third, actually, before I get to the third, I think some people were already talking about the UC presidential working group on AI report. It might have already been pasted into the chat. But we developed a report that operationalized the UC responsible AI principles in four high-risk areas for the University of California. One was in human resources. The second was for UC policing. Uh, the third was for health. Uh, UC health serves millions of patients. And then the fourth we called student experience, and that was tracking students all along their time with the university and beyond from the moment that they apply to the university, get in, choose courses, um, move through the program, and graduate. Now, the third strategic goal was for us to create a foundation for campus level councils and UC-wide coordination. Obviously, knowing that the University of California, while, we'll, while we are all one family, we are all our own distinct individual, right? Just like a normal family. The siblings might all look exactly the same, but each wants to be their own entity, but still be part of that family. So we wanted to make sure that there's flexibility in how each campus would actually implement and operationalize those UC responsible AI principles. Oh, somebody's unmuted again. All right, so the methods that we use, we did a literature review of um, development of these responsible AI strategies within the public sector. At the time when we started this work, there wasn't actually that much. I'm very happy to see that there has been significantly more work in this space around accountability within the public sector. Uh, we did a campus survey of campus CIOs and CTOs to see, well, is AI even used on your campus? How is it used? Um, and at that time, there were a lot of responses that AI wasn't being used. Now, that could have been an artifact of how we were defining AI in our survey, or that really they just didn't know because they weren't capturing that information, especially in procurement. And then we also did interviews um, with individuals across the 10 campuses. Okay, here are the University of California responsible AI principles. As I said before, appropriateness is that very first one. That is so incredibly important because we all get the pressure, you can see it, of just jumping to using this shiny new tool to try to solve some of our problems. But we have to question if it's actually appropriate for that use. <clears throat> Next is transparency. I'm going to take a quick sip of water. Uh, next is accuracy, reliability, and safety. If we're using these AI-enabled systems and we're using them in high-risk settings, they probably should be accurate, reliable, and safe. Um, now, all of this is saying that the field right now is so nascent. While we all have these responsible AI principles, there are large academic labs, industry, governments, who are trying to figure out, well, what does accuracy mean? What does reliability mean and safety mean? And so that's being developed right now. Same with fairness and non-discrimination. Please, if any of you get a third party vendor who comes to you and says, our tool, whatever, is completely bias free, send them away because it shows their ignorance. You cannot develop a machine learning tool that is 100% bias free. And you can't because you cannot simultaneously address all forms of bias without causing bias in another area. NIST issued a report calling out three main types of bias in machine learning systems, human bias or implicit bias, as we've mentioned before, institutional bias. So for example, um, in the United States, certain zip codes are predominantly of one race because of institutionalized bias in society. And then the third is statistical bias. Now in that NIST report under those three categories, they have various like sub 
types of bias. And they, they demonstrate that you cannot simultaneously address all the biases across those three. So if you have a vendor say to you, we are completely bias free, say, no, you're not. What types of bias are most important in your tool and how are you mitigating that bias? Next, of course, is privacy and security. Um, we get that. We already have a lot of data privacy and security protocols, especially when we're, when we're in procurement. Uh, the next human values, right? Um, are we using an AI enabled system that adheres to the values um, that we all hold? Uh, shared benefit and prosperity, and then also accountability. So I'm going to move forward. I already talked about the subcommittees um, to some of our recommendations because I, I want to definitely make sure that we have time for questions and discussion. Within our recommendations out of that report, the first was to actually institutionalize the use see responsible AI principles within procurement and oversight practices. Now, why within procurement? Well, within procurement, because we have contracts, right? We have contracts with developers. And I encourage you all to understand the power that the university has. Now, vendors will come and they'll say, and you'll get pressure from people within the university saying, I need this tool. I need this system because it's inefficient. We're going to save money. We're going to serve the university better. Well, guess what? That vendor needs to sell their product. Like you have so much more power to get them to do better than to just say, oh, your tool's proprietary and we, we can't see what's going on. Oh, that's okay. No, if it's going to be applied in a high risk setting, put pressure on them to demonstrate to the university continuously throughout the use at whatever interval we deem is necessary that they are actually mitigating those risks, right? They need us more than we need them, very likely. Now, the second um, was to establish these campus level councils and system-wide coordination, which we are now doing through the UCAI Council. The third is development of a risk and impact assessment strategy. And I mean, what's great right now is we're seeing these being developed in real time. The NIST AI risk management framework, while it's a voluntary framework, it was released earlier this year, we're starting to see those profiles being developed, operationalizing the NIST AI risk management framework in various domains. It's incredibly useful. So instead of your unit or whatever, developing your own risk assessment strategy, lean on what's already been developed. I want to give a cautionary note though for this one, that because there are so many different types of risk and impact assessment strategies, now they all fall under the responsible AI principles. All of them are trying to achieve those principles, but they're different, right? The NIST AI risk management framework is different from the EU's conformity assessment that's different from other evaluations. So my warning to you is that there is a burgeoning sector of startups that are saying, look, company, give us your technology. We'll evaluate it on the NIST AI risk management framework, the EU conformity assessment, yada, yada, yada. And we'll make sure you're compliant so that you don't have to have, you know, those personnel in-house. We'll do it for you at a cost of whatever amount. One of my worries is fly-by-night groups that are going to be doing this. They have an incentive to approve those companies' tools because they need more companies coming in to get assessed, right? So maybe some companies will say, oh, you got, you you failed this Companies uh, review via the NIST AI RMF. Well, this one tends to be a lot more flexible. So be very cautious if you are procuring a technology from a third party vendor and they say, oh, we had this certifier review us. Uh, this is a problem that I think is becoming more recognized. And we believe that there will be some standards developed for those certifiers, licensors, et cetera. Um, and then the last one was the documentation of AI enabled technologies that pose greater than moderate risk to individual rights in a public database. The UC AI Council is moving forward all of this work, as you can see here. So on the left, you see the recommendations that I just went over. And then now you can see the implementation where we, we actually see the, the, the first one going into principles, procurement, and practices. What we found in our work was don't create a whole new AI like assessment process. It's a terrible idea. Instead, lean on what we're already doing in the university. We already have data protection, data privacy reviews. Lean on that, right, within the procurement. 
we have established definitions. Uh, lean on that. Don't create anything new. See and take stock of what principles and uh, processes and practices we already have that we can just use. Um, the second we mentioned, we already established the UCI Council. The third I mentioned already too, that lean on existing frameworks. Now the NIST Air Risk Management Framework is good, but not great. Um, yeah, there are some parts of it that, that aren't necessarily going to work, but you don't have to use every single part of the NIST AI risk management framework. You can think of it as a starting point of how to evaluate and mitigate risks. Oh, and then documentation. Of course, the first step is being clear on what you mean by AI-enabled systems uh, and making it as lightweight as possible in that reporting. Now, one way to do that actually might be to use a machine learning model to look at your vendor contracts and some of the language and filter them out and see, you know, then do some human review and then put that into the database. And here is the NIST AI Risk Management Framework, which I was just going to scroll through here. They have this playbook that goes through all of the elements of the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. It's incredibly Helpful. So you can look at accountability and transparency, for example. And you might want to go to what I, map 3.2. You can open that up and it actually gives you some recommendations. Look at the potential costs, including non-monetary costs, which result from expected or realized errors. Like this is going to be such a helpful tool for all of you to think about actually implementing all of this in practice. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, partnered with the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity where we developed a profile for those general purpose AI systems and foundation models for the NIST AI risk management framework. So walking everybody through, how do you do that for each of the categories within the NIST AI risk management framework? Now, okay, I wanna wrap this up uh, as quickly as possible because I have a lot to talk about here. The executive order on AI, as I mentioned, is it was passed by the White House, um, Biden administration on October 30th. We also had voluntary commitments earlier in this year. Uh, legislation, Citrus Policy Lab maintains a database of all federal and California legislation targeting AI. I think that database is over 300 pieces uh, right now, but it's really fun to play with it. It's in Airtable. You can we tag everything of what it's trying to address. We say, is it bipartisan? Was it a Republican who introduced, a Democrat who introduced? Where, like, what's its current status? Um, it's really fun. And then, of course, regulatory authority. In the absence of a comprehensive legislation law on AI, we're already just leaning on regulatory authority. <clears throat> so the Federal Trade Commission is the probably the strongest entity right here because they, through the FTC Act, can oversee um, unfair and deceptive practices by companies. And that includes AI, and they have written about that. Uh, they put out a public statement saying that this is definitely within their purview. We also see that in the executive order on AI, where President Biden says that those federal agencies should be pushing more of their authority in this space that's already there, that they can already act upon. Uh, here's the federal AI landscape. Let's just pass that. Now, 2023 was a big year for, for um, moving forward on AI governance strategies. Um, you can see those. And the slides will be shared <clears throat> with you all later if you want to review. Uh, I wrote a piece in Tech Policy Press about why the White House voluntary AI commitments were important. Um, a lot of people gave them gruff saying, it's too weak. It's too late whatever. But in the absence of an ability to pass comprehensive legislation, it's the best that we can do right now. And I think what we have to do as a university and as consumers is put those companies' feet to the fire to say, look, you signed these White House AI commitments that include transparency reports on the benefits and risks of your technology and what risk mitigation strategies you've implemented. I want to see that. I mean, they signed it. Make them follow through. No, that's it. Okay. I think if we can go to the next one. As I mentioned before, the thing I'm really concerned about are these third party auditors, evaluators, licensors, and certifiers coming to you or having other companies say, Oh, I went through Parity AI. They audited me. My system's fine. 
you need to question whether or not Parity AI did a robust enough job in the auditing process. And here is my contact information if you want to take a screenshot. And then in a second, if people are taking a screenshot, then I will stop sharing and I'd love to ask, like have some discussion. Okay. okay. I think there were some questions already coming in. Bill, how would you like to handle this? Do you want me to just find some of the questions? Yeah, why don't we have people put questions in chat and then either you can, if you're reading them, you can just pick the ones um, or or you can have uh, Kara or uh, uh, I read them to you, however you want to do it. Mm. Uh, and I do see, I had one that came directly to me that is the at tag to you. I don't know that there were any before that that you didn't already address. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll just read them and then answer them. So uh, is the NIST profile mentioned and what's Oscar? What's that? Profile, O-S-C-A-L, what's that? Bill, you're muted. I was pulling up an example of it. This came as a question okay. and it wasn't clearly spelled out, but there was a link to this sort of thing in GitHub that was from the NIST site. And so mm -hmm. I, it looks like these profiles are, um, I don't have the answer to his question. Okay, well, I have an answer to the second part. Yes, it is online. Let me grab it for you, um, and I will throw it in the chat. And it is right uh, while we're doing that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll do it in a minute. I want to get another question up so we're not wasting time. Has anyone checked around to find out what other groups on campus have been trying to put together similar parallel related AI oversight efforts? Yes, Avi, that's one of the issues. And we just had a meeting about this earlier this week, even, that we don't want to risk the problem of us having redundancy of work and non-consensus. So we are trying to make sure that all of the different groups, and there are many of them, are at least communicating with each other. So sometimes that means people sit on various committees, and then that way they're that tie between them. But that is a problem. Oh, thank you for transcribing the screen, Jason. So it's on there for everybody. Okay, do we have any case studies or deep dives into specific AI use cases within the UC to illustrate how ethical principles are practically applied? Yes, we do. In the uh, Presidential Working Group on AI, we give case studies across those four categories, health, human resources, policing, and student experience. And so we talk about what are the benefits of using it within those domains? What are the risks? How do you actually operationalize the principles? Uh, yeah, the picture of people alongside the president did not seem to present diversity, but it's arguably a photo that reflects some realities of our world. Might, might we want, hold on, I move. <clears throat> might we want AI to generate an image like that or reflect more diversity? That is, how do we balance some use cases where we might want AI to reflect the world as it is versus reflect our values? especially where those differ. I love this question, Greg. Like, I need more water. I've been talking a lot, but a lot of people think that AI creates bias. It doesn't. It perpetuates right. it, and it can amplify it. And in so doing, it you cannot deny that the bias is there, right? As the young people say, it's, it shows a receipt. <laughs> like, you, it demonstrates that it was there. Um, so that means then we can address it. And I love this idea then once you identify it, how can you use AI to actually now mitigate the bias that you were able to affirm was there? Because yeah, the you'll see it in the model and the output. Thanks, okay. I attended the Athens Roundtable on AI and the Rule of Law earlier today and was vastly disappointed. Oh, great. My talk was miles ahead so far. Thanks. Global policymakers continue to talk about the risks of AI in a future tense. While the technology is still unfolding, it is here in the present tense, and so is the need for informed governance. However, we continue to fall victim to the calling ridge dilemma. How can governments activate dynamic and timely responses to emerging technologies? How can academics and thought leaders enable this capability beyond advising politicians? Would you encourage AI experts to run for public office to substantiate technologically informed social transformation? Yeah, love this. Green, and I know the some of the people at the Athens roundtable. Um, 
First, the White House Executive Order on AI mandates that every federal department and agency have a chief AI officer. It's going to be very interesting to see how that shakes out because it's just going to be AI technical experts from CS. Will it be more people who have a socio-technical training? I think that'll be very interesting. Um, and then for your first paragraph, I am so annoyed with the hyped focus on generative AI systems. Yeah, they're scary and they have the potential for wide scale societal risk, but we currently have much weaker forms of AI machine learning that are applied in very high stakes settings that are determining whether or not you are able to like engage with your own rights. Like we have to stop hyper-focusing on the sexy toy and think about, wow, actually right now in all of our institutions, all of our systems, we're already using data and models to make consequential decisions. So that's, I love that first part. I'm very worried about that. Um, let's see. Okay, um, let's talk about, I like key. <clears throat> Yours, AI is everywhere and we're all using it every day. It, yes. Yes. Um, I'm consulting on a BBC documentary series that's going to air next summer. And they did a survey of 7,000, like a representative survey of 7,000 people. And they all like 90% of them said they don't engage with AI daily. Um, they obviously do, right? You engage with recommender systems. That's a form of AI. So yeah, there's a misunderstanding that we engage with them every day. And what are some examples of high-risk AI systems that we, be, we should be concerned about? I think it's not it's not about the system, it's about the application. So what are the high-risk areas that we should be concerned about where AI is being applied? And I think it's anywhere where anybody's protected right is at risk of being infringed upon. Um, okay. What do you suggest we do when students are using AI tools and posting on TikTok about it, mentioning that they are UC Berkeley students and are offering tips and tricks I use to get all A's at Berkeley? I mean, there that is such an important point. The cat's out of the bag. We can't stop students from using these generative AI systems, but we should train them on, well, what are the benefits? What are the risks uh, of you using this? And maybe some of them, actually, the tips and tricks might be, you know, studying for a few hours, um, not cheating. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Yep, uh, I see uh, some people t are replying. Everybody's really engaged, it's so exciting. Um, yeah, I've heard about medical decision systems being high risk, who gets access to care. Uh, Leon, we see both sides of that argument in that BBC meeting, there was somebody there who does like medical AI and said, look, you know, a lot of people can't get access to physicians. If you think about the global South, AI could enable them to actually get access. And putting aside the potential for bias, just because we don't have data on some of these communities, um, I raised the point too, that the AI system doesn't work in isolation from the broader economy. So even if let's say you were able to diagnose somebody through looking at their eyes that they have type two diabetes. Like, do we have the infrastructure to be able to service and give insulin to all of the people who need it at a rate? So also this idea of AI uh, displacing the workforce, I think is way overhyped, right? Like that's just to get clicks. What I just said too is, okay, yeah, you can deploy this to be able to know that more people need insulin. And then maybe that would spur the development of more like synthetic manufacturing of insulin around the world. Like who create new, new small to medium sized enterprises for the new things that we're gonna find out, the new needs in society. Um, yeah, as a former high school math teacher, I remember the older teachers fighting against the use of graphing calculators, but we found a way to use the technology to assist learning as opposed to replacing it. I feel like the same process we use in gender today. I totally agree. And look, Jake, we have a hand raised. We only have one minute left. So Jake, let's. Uh, there's a lot of products. They're all racing to market. We buy a lot of products here. What should we be thinking about when we're talking about vendor assessments? There's a lot of work in that space. Um, 
Now the Ford Foundation, how about I put together all of these sources and I'm going to give them to Bill and Bill can distribute them. The Ford Foundation put out a report about how do you assess technology vendors? Uh, and it's it's really good. It's a really good one. Also, the World Economic Forum did the procurement in a box, and it has guiding questions. What, you, what should you be asking of the vendor? What are some of the requirements you should put on them? What are the timelines, et cetera? Brandy, thank you so much for this. This was really fantastic. We are at time. And before people drop, I just want to let you know, this is not the last you're going to be hearing from Brandy. She's agreed to advise the community of practice. She's also advising us on governance here at Berkeley, where we're looking to try to, to stitch this sort of big picture together to align it from the top down, from the values to how we operationalize it. So um, my uh, the planning team that's come together that I chatted, everyone who's participating, we're all envisioning using the community of practice as a conduit for two-way communications between us, the people of the community and leadership of the university to help uh, a better, to get better results around governance by getting all of your perspectives more um, early, often woven into the discussion. So thank you, Brandy, so much uh, for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you all for having me. And we will right, see I'm gonna you. hop off to my next meeting. Thank you, Brandy. We'll see you Take next care. month, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.